The following interview was conducted with Professor Philip Nelson, William R. Sholey, Edward Endow Chair, uh, food, Chair in Food Processing for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, February the 8th, 2008 at Stewart Center in room B26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years and siblings and... Sure. I was born, uh, actually born in a hospital in Shelbyville, Indiana, but I grew up on a farm near Morristown, Indiana, which is, uh, oh, it's about 30 miles outside of Indianapolis. Uh, we grew up on a farm. We had a, a family also owned a tomato canning plant facility. Um, so I grew up also uh, working in that, that uh, operation as well. In the town? And actually, the canning plant was in the town. and. Uh, I have uh, three siblings. Uh, they're all older. I'm the youngest. In fact, I was the first to be born in a hospital. Weighed almost 12 pounds. And the nurse said, you better hold on to him. He may walk out of the hospital. But <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't grow into that, uh, that body, I guess. Um, I have a, a two sisters and a brother. But all, they're all still living. Uh -huh. And, uh, Are your, were your parents born around in that area? Yes, that area? in fact, my father died in the house he was born in. So, uh, yes, they were all, all local there. Uh -huh. and, uh, my was mother was a DePaul graduate in 19, I guess it was 1911, 1912. Okay, what year were you born? What was your birth date? What year were you born? Yeah, I was November 12, 1934. Okay. So. And what was high school like? I uh, uh, went to Morristown High School. It was all, the school was all in uh, one building from first grade through 12. And I think I had 28, 29 in my class. And when so you graduated from high school? When I graduated okay. from high school before coming to Purdue, yeah. Okay. How did you happen to select Purdue and tell us a little bit about Yeah, your Purdue experience? was, I think I was destined for Purdue. There really wasn't any discussion about where else I would go. Uh, my father, I'm sure, thought I would come back and run the farm and the canning plant. And so the logical place was Purdue. I'd also, early on, um, when I was about 15, I'd won the, the uh, tomato uh, prize at the state fair, and I was, I was uh, deemed the tomato king at that time. Um, there was a gentleman from Purdue, uh, Roscoe Frazier, who worked in extension that uh, really set me up, brought me to Purdue. Uh, I did, had lunch with Governor Schricker at that time. Uh, Drove around the Indy 500 in a car, and I'm 15. As a result of the winning that As winning that, got a gold watch. So that sort of uh, set me up, certainly, for, for right. Purdue. Tell us a little bit about that contest. I know in archives of special collections that there used to be an, an annual thing. You don't hear very much about no, it. No, you don't. I, it, and it again, was quite it was, unique. It was probably through 4-H, uh, uh -huh. from what I recall. But I had to, t had to win the, the local, the county. Uh, Shelby County Fair, and then I went on to the uh, State Fair in Indianapolis. I had to have 48 perfect tomatoes, uh, fresh, uh, fresh tomatoes, and so they, that was the, the, uh, the, the project. And then, uh, of course, then they were selected, and so I was. It was kind of a nice with, feat. Oh, then. Oh, it was fun. That <laughs> tomato came really, and I was on television, and that was Harry Martin was the MC. Uh, I'm sure he's not living. But that's when the screens were round and only black and white. Right. <laughs> and small, right? And small and right. snowy. <laughs> right. Oh. What year did you enter Purdue then? I came to Purdue in 1952. Okay. 1952. Stayed in Cary Hall. I was fortunate. I got into one of the, uh, the big rooms that were there in the, in the tower. Uh, and so uh, I stayed there for a year and then I joined a fraternity. Mm -hmm. But I uh, came, came and uh, took agriculture, and I went, wanted really general agriculture. <clears throat> I wasn't really specific because I knew I was going to go back um, to the family business. And uh, what uh, sort of activities and clubs and that we were involved in? Oh, yeah, in? that was probably the biggest thing that changed my life. Now, coming from a small community, I was... And a uh, small school in high school. And a small school. I was... Al Stewart selected me into the Glee Club, and all of a sudden now I'm traveling uh, around the country where I've never had never been before. So that was that quite was exciting, and certainly had an impact. Right. And what was the campus like? And was it? Uh, well, you know, the campus if I can recall was about twelve thousand students. Probably the best thing I remember was it was about six or eight to one men to women, 
and you had to move fast to, to, get, uh, to get the woman of your choice. <laughs> I was a junior uh, at that time and uh, met my wife on her first week on campus. So, uh, was, she, did you, was she a student here? She was a student here, okay. undergraduate freshman, and uh, met her in the union. I had come back early, was a freshman for Snyder, and uh, we've now been married uh, 50, going on 53 years. Oh, very nice. Yeah. They had a lot of events in the Union, didn't they? They did. Time? Oh, many events. That was the, sort of the center for the social activities. Certainly was the center, and of course, uh, we, we both pledged um, she a sorority and a fraternity, and they happened to be next door to each other. The interesting thing, there was only one telephone in each house, so we had cowbells, and we could open the windows and ring, and someone would say, Sue, Phil's calling. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of so, unique. Yeah, it was quite unique. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, then uh, did you work at all when you were on? Um, no, I didn't have to. Uh -huh. I was able to focus on, on studies. Of course, there wasn't any food science at that time, but there was a professor in horticulture um, who was a food scientist in the fruit and vegetable processing area. So I took Courses, Some of his courses, took yeah. courses from him, and then of course other courses. Uh, right. Had John Hicks as an instructor, and uh, uh, many many of the people that uh, uh, you know impacted right. on your lives. What then? What was your career path prior to coming to Purdue? Uh, did you go to graduate school, or what? well, not, you mean after after I, you got your well uh, after, after I got my degree, I went back to the family business for four years, and so that was fifty six and uh, operated the factory, and then we closed the factory in 1960. There used to be about 200 canneries in Indiana, uh, almost one on every corner. Uh, this was the center of the industry. Just like their automobile industry at one time. Yeah, at the, one time it was huge. Uh, yeah. But they uh, discovered California, um, and so everything moved west, and we, we decided to close the business. And of course, there's only one major uh, canning plant left, Red Gull, here in, in, in Indiana. So when that, uh, when we closed, uh, the thought was, at least my family thought, that I would just stay on and operate the farm. We had about 500 acres at that time. And uh, What kind of farm did you, was it? It was a general farm. Okay. We, we raised, we raised, of course, and, and uh, rented a lot of acreage for tomatoes. We grew about 500 acres of processing tomatoes. But uh, my wife and I decided we really didn't want to live on a farm. You were married at that time? We were married, uh -huh. had one child. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we'd been there four years and uh, uh, had a two-year-old daughter. And so we decided I was either going to be a feed salesman or I might consider coming back to Purdue. Um, so we came up, I interviewed with the vet school. Uh, they had 50 slots, but after the interview they said we'll add them. 51. So I had been accepted into the vet school uh, and got to uh, Purdue in June to look at it for an apartment and uh, uh, just happened to stop into horticulture to talk to this professor that I'd had in food science and before I left his office I had called the vet school and said I'm not coming. I'm, I've got an assistantship in horticulture. I'm going to be a food scientist. So that, again, another uh, really change in, uh, Certainly did. in, in my life, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you ended up then getting your, both your master's and your PhD? I went directly, no, I oh. went directly for the PhD. It was an interesting time. I should have probably quit many times because I had three major professors. Um, the professor that convinced me to stay there uh, ended up leaving after uh, two years to go into industry with Beech Nut Foods. So I had a, another professor. Um, with that professor for a year, and he went to Colorado State, and then with a third professor that actually, when I finished my degree, but uh, each time I changed my st study, what I was working on, and uh, it, was a, it was a process. But I was put on staff uh, after my professor, first professor left, so I was an instructor then in 1961. So I really have been on, on faculty then since that time. Okay. Then that, uh, that brings us to the Department of Food Science. That was mm -hmm. formed in 84. Go tell us well, a little we, bit about yeah, that. Yeah, we had, uh, th there were pieces of evidence of, of the food science in different departments, in horticulture, uh, agronomy, uh, biochemistry, uh, ag and bioengineering, um, just to name a few. 
And uh, we decided that we'd form an institute. So in, I guess it was 76, mm, okay. an institute was formed. And then a few years later, I was named director of the institute. A few years later, they moved the institute uh, people into Smith Hall. And so we had an institute there until all we, all we did was undergraduate curriculum. That was, that was it. We, we, that's was there the any research going on at that time? Well, or? certainly, oh. yes. And my research began back in horticulture way before that. In, okay. Uh, in 69 uh, when I began that research. But following on for the food science department, we, uh, for, uh, in 1983, uh, we were in a really uh, t tough budget crunch and they were uh, eliminating positions in uh, agriculture. Uh, Bernie, <coughs> excuse me, Bernie Liska was dean mm -hmm. and uh, he had to meet with the uh, president and trustees, decide what they were going to do with this little institute. Um, what was the enrollment? Were you uh, giving yeah, classes? Yeah, we had probably 30 undergraduates. Okay. It, was, mm -hmm. it was small. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the decision uh, and, uh, was made, and President Beering was here, that they would keep and form a food science department. It would have been very easy to eliminate our positions um, because they could have said there's no longer a need for that. But sure. uh, it was decided to keep it. So. It was good news, bad news. The good news is you have a department. The bad news is, was there's no money. <laughs> so we're nine faculty and 30 students started the department in 83. Mm -hmm. And could tell us a little bit about uh, the growth in curriculum and students and how it changed over time? Is, yeah, we, uh, we really, um, you know, could have said, well, the first department of food science. First school. department, yeah, first department. It, I was named department head. And we could have said, woe is us, uh, and you know, whenever the university or state gives us money, we can do something. But um, took a different tact and decided to really uh, call upon the industry, food industry, uh, to help us. And so there were, I had, I had been, uh, had consulted for Campbell Soup for 15 years. And when the director of research uh, retired, and he was from Indiana, got his BS here, um, uh, Dr. Denton uh, retired. I said, okay, it's your turn to help me. So uh, we started um, the department um, and formed a number of things, formed an industrial advisory group and the only uniqueness was they had to pay me to be on their, be on our board. And uh, so we were beginning to get some money and then we got some industry grants and some endowments and so we began to grow and really followed the industry uh, model of what we call TQM, Total Quality Management. Mm -hmm. Uh, identified consumers and students. We looked at students as consumers and industries are consumers and so that that evolved and of course um, um, as I say we started with nine faculty and 30 students today we have 22 faculty and about 250 students. Did it originally start just for undergraduates and then did you broaden it to a graduate program? No, we, well? we immediately put in a graduate program. Oh, okay. Um, there, there had been, uh, in, in the various departments, you could get a PhD. Like I got a PhD in horticulture, uh, even though it was in, in the food area of food science. Mm -hmm. So no, we, we put that all together and uh, I managed to, to, you know, with uh, smoke and mirrors, as I would say, managed to uh, take this uh, program and uh, we were the obviously the youngest program and the smallest program in '83. Today, we're probably the largest undergraduate and maybe the total department program. Very good. There are about 42 departments of food science from Cornell to UC Davis, and mostly in the land grant schools. Uh -huh. And uh, all of them had been established for many years. And so we had some catch up to do. <laughs> <laughs> now let's turn a little bit about the. Earth the ACES processing and packaging mm -hmm. and share some of that for the researchers who are going to be, who will be able to benefit by okay. this. So uh, it was I'll leave it kind of open-ended yeah, for Yeah, this you. really all began in 1969. Um, well, actually before that, when I was in, in the canning business um, here in Indiana, um, we only had about eight weeks to get the tomato into the can and preserve. And so we ended up losing a lot or making the wrong decision. We made too much ketchup and not enough juice, or made too much puree and not enough sauce. And so it was always, uh, all, all, it was very complicated. You, you tried to guess, but then the people down the road were trying to guess, and you both guessed the same thing, so you had, had too much. So when I came to Purdue, um, I thought, is there any way that we could uh, uh, 
uh, solve that problem. And one way would be if we could take those tomatoes and quickly chop them and put them into a tank and then throughout the rest of the year make the product as the market needed. And that's what resulted in the aseptic bulk storage. Aseptic processing had been uh, discovered in about 1940 and had been used only for small packages. Um, uh, I think you're familiar with the brick package like the Tetra, we call it Tetra Pack, that you mm -hmm. get the juices and milk in and so forth. Um, so that had been around, but no one had, had gone into large scale. So uh, in 68, I wrote 10 letters to uh, industry to see if anyone would be interested in sponsoring this because there wasn't any federal money or university money. And there was one, one company said, uh, okay, and they, they were a company that made tanks for the beer industry. And they were looking maybe for a new market. And uh, it was a family-owned business, so I could talk directly with the president and try to convince him that here is a new chance for him. And so uh, they built uh, five little tanks. Uh, in, your, in the building in, there? Yes, they're in the horticulture building. Um, some were lined with an epoxy resin, some were stainless. And uh, uh, I developed some valves, aseptic valves and uh, filters that uh, wasn't available then. And, with, I s always say, with good, inexpensive labor, not cheap labor, student labor, we filled those tanks up and then selected, uh, were able to select the right process. It was also inter interesting at that time, this would be in 69, that my um, experiment station director of research came into my office and said, didn't think I should take that industry money, that it would be bad for my career, and discouraged me from, from take going on with the project. Well, I didn't listen to him, and of course now... Got those uh, tomatoes, right? Yes, that's right. And fortunately, uh, uh, you know, we've gone on. And of course, today we, we use a lot of industry money for uh, many of our projects. How did you uh, form a team? You had a team of people that... Well, there, there was a group. Key. Yeah, there was a group. Obviously, uh, the team involved industry as well as university people because... Uh, you know, we would have ideas and we were able to do analysis, but then we had to have someone else to make the equipment and, uh, um, you know, put it into a shape that it could be used. So it was really a university industry team. Uh -huh. uh, the 100 gallons, uh, we were successful microbiologically, good nutrition and color, but the industry told us it was uh, too small. They'd fill it in a second. And so most, I think most university people would have said, uh, professors would have said, you know, I've got my patents, I've got publications, that's enough. Uh, but I was challenged to see if I could make it work. So we put a thousand gallon tank outside of the Hort building here at Purdue um, on the uh, east side of the building and had to insulate it so the tomatoes wouldn't freeze. And then it took us about a week and the students and us uh, filled that tank up with chopped tomato held it for 18 months, brought the industry back, and quality was good, everything was fine, but again, they said it was too small. So I tried to find, a, I, I knew that was as big as we could go here on, the, on campus, so I tried to find an industry to work with, found one in Pennsylvania, outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania, so they put in two 15,000 gallon tanks. Uh, again, the industry building the tanks and so forth, and now I took flew from here to Allentown. On, oh, uh, the tanks were there. Not the here. tanks were there now, and uh, we would go on a Wednesday, uh, fill, start filling these tanks, come back on Sunday, so the students could go back to class and leave again and, and go back through the uh, harvest season. And I'll never forget. In October, I got a call and said, uh, "I hate to tell you this, Dr. Nelson, but those thirty thousand gallons of pizza sauce have all spoiled." And we were spreading them on the hills of Pennsylvania. Oh my goodness, that was that was a big blow. <laughs> but we'd kept good records, and we knew where there was a problem, a mistake. Sure. So we. The documentation is key. It was very yeah. key. Where did where were you getting your supply? Where were the tomatoes? Tomatoes were there, right there. This was the canning plant there oh, in, in okay. Pennsylvania. It was a tomato processing plant. So. Uh, but the ones that were you were using on campus for demonstration? Were from here. here. We had uh, we had a farm out on the uh, it was called the O'Neill Farm, on the uh, south side of uh, Lafayette. That's where we got the tomatoes on campus. Okay. So we corrected the problem. Went back the second year, and and voila, it worked.
and an, an entrepreneur here from Indiana came to my office and said, will it work? And with my fingers crossed under the table, I said, I think so. And so he put in eight 40,000 gallon tanks. Huge, uh, huge. And I knew we either had something or had the biggest Bloody Mary or the Guinness record <laughs> in the world, but we were successful. For, 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 for not prefer that. <laughs> yes, and it went on from there. The Japanese um, wanted the technology, a company called Kikoman, and so I found myself going to Japan many times to help get that installation. They put in 80,000 gallon tanks. Uh, we had grape juice tanks go in at Seneca Foods. Um, uh, we, we had rail cars, 20,000 gallon rail cars bringing paste from California back to the Midwest where they would make the ketchup or something rather than shipping all the bottles at uh, that time. And so that, that moved along, but it was also in, uh, in the mid-70s that another gentleman came into my lab and said, uh, I can pack battery acid in this plastic bag. I'd like to be able to put food in. So uh, he brought his equipment and worked with him in our laboratory, and his name was William Sholey. Uh, and uh, shortly he left the lab and went to California and started his, his business. And now 90% uh, of the world's tomatoes are packed in this bag and box. And uh, all of the orange juice that's not from concentrate is put in these tanks. So it's 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 amazing it's, to see. It, you you look at it and you think, yes, it's great. Yes, it's and just, it's, it's fulfilling, and you, you uh -huh. just kept after it and worked. Yes, on it. yeah, it was a lot of hard work, determination. Yes, and, and, you got, and you've got quite a few patents, as uh, yes, right. yes, they're 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 all expired now. But it, yes, well, I think we had uh, eleven or twelve. How was it, uh, was it difficult getting the first patent? Because the uh, patent process was a lot different Pat then, the, back then. Uh, yes, it was, although there were fewer patents being applied for. There wasn't a backlog in the patent like office is. like there is today. Sure. So it, uh, it went through fairly, fairly fast, fairly yeah. quick. And uh, all of a sudden, we were better off trapped in, huh? <laughs> yes, that's right. right. We were off and Tell us a little bit, something about outreach. You have those workshops mm -hmm. every year. Uh, do you have different people that come? Oh, certainly, yeah. Right. We, we, uh, uh, I established a workshop, uh, well, it'll be um, 25 years ago this year. I uh -huh. um, thought we'd have the first workshop, and uh, we, we limit it to um, uh, 40 people, the one here on campus, and then we would charge a big, uh, a big entry fee and um, have hands-on. We could actually break them up into smaller groups, take them into the lab. Thought we'd do it one year. I had to. I didn't have people on campus who were aseptic people, so I had to bring in people from off campus. But uh, it was. We filled it up, and there was a waiting list. So we decided to do it second year, and that that's gone on from yeah. there. And and these are people from all over the world, and so it wasn't just um, local people. We had we had from from every part of the, the country. Um, was it industry and academe? And, and uh, mostly industry. Okay. Mostly industry, wanting to know how to, to do this aseptic processing. And I might just quickly tell you about aseptic processing. Yeah. In that, For the researchers. Yeah, right. you know the traditional canning. You put the food into the can, you close it up, and you heat it inside the container. And of course, that means you've got to overheat the outside in order to get to the middle. Well, with aseptic processing, it, we, we sterilize the product outside of the can, and we sterilize the package separately, and then we put the two together. Uh, we cool this product down so that you can put it in a film, you can put it in a cardboard box, or you could also put it in a can. The so product. It, the product. So it, it allows you to have a much less uh, costly package, and uh, also then that product can sit on the shelf uh, well, for a long time. Milk, uh, we can process milk and have it there for a year. Uh, and it's used throughout the world, of course, particularly where there's no coal chain uh, in the developing countries, parts of the world. So anyway, this, this aseptic process uh, was really what I used to uh, uh, put it into a, a big container, a uh, very big container. The, the orange juice now, uh, they are in containers that are over 1.8 million gallons. They're six stories tall, six stories wide. Wow. Single strength orange juice. And then of course the, the Brazilians who were shipping us concentrate said we're out of business. And so they came to my, my office again and uh, we decided to put tanks in a ship. 
And so now that was an innovation, right? That was a big innovation. So I worked with a Nor Norwegian ship company, and we've now we now have 16 tanks in the ship, um, half a million gallons each, and they uh, it hauls eight million gallons. It's the length of two football fields and uh, two stories tall. And Brazil, which employs over 400,000 people in the citrus industry now, has kept their market. They ship it not only to the U.S., but also to, uh, uh, to Europe. Globally. Right. Globally, yeah. yeah. This was, our first work was with Tropicana, uh, but currently now all of them use, uh, use my technology. So. It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's you, tell amazing. us about that ship, that the sample that you have that they made. Oh yes, yeah. I of course I was, you know, hard to believe that they could do the ship water on a ship, but uh, economy of scale allowed them to do that. And so I said I'd really like a model for <clears throat> for my mantle, and this is to the Norwegians. And so I didn't hear anything back for a couple of years, and I get a phone call and saying, well, your model has arrived on the east coast. We're going to bring it to you by truck. And I thought, well, that's nice that they're going to bring my, my <laughs> mantle uh, boats here. Well, when they get here, it's uh, eight feet long and weighs almost 500 pounds. It's one one-hundredth scale. And my wife decided she didn't want that in the house. <laughs> so I've left it here for the right. department. And it's quite a conversation. My ship came, my ship came in, right? My ship came in. <laughs> Oh dear. One of the conferences you had, that Global Food Systems Conference in 93, that was kind of, that was a big one. And then your the big <laughs> summit, an industry summit. That's right. Now, uh, tell us a little bit about the planning that we Well, had again, things. those were trying to, to uh, uh, we couldn't even do aseptic processing here in the States in, uh, in, in these consumer containers until 1982. Um, Food and Drug had not approved the use of peroxide to sterilize the package. That's how you sterilize a, a paper package. Sure. Or with the bag and box, we sterilize it with the radiation, the inside of that package. Um, so once that was accomplished, then we were wanting to stimulate the industry. So we would, we would have these kind of global conferences, uh, bring in the experts, and then uh, try to expose that to uh, our local industries. And, uh, so we did that for a couple of years, um, the, the big mega conferences. Sure, right. Then we did the workshops, and then we decided that many of the industry, uh, the line workers needed to know uh, about aseptic because, you, you know, it's sterile. You can't just touch something like you could before. So you need uh, to know that what you're... What you were doing. And right. so we would um, actually, by this time now, I had... Uh, had uh, most of our, all of our faculty here on campus now were familiar and experts in aseptic in various phases, microbiology, chemistry, packaging, processing, and engineering. And so uh, we would actually take the workshop on the road, and we would go, and still do, we go to plant site and uh, train maybe uh, 200 workers on, uh, you know, the very fundamentals of, of aseptic processing. And we've, we've done this around the world. Uh, we did it in last March in China, and uh, we're the national trainers for uh, PepsiCo now in aseptic processing. So, uh, just keeps growing. It doesn't just it? keeps growing. Right. And aseptic is is again on an upsurge. It's growing as well. Does the Red Gold in, in uh, Indiana do they mm -hmm. use that as well? You know, it's interesting. They are, they're the again, only pl yeah. you, uh, plant canning, the, yeah, and the, they're, they're local. I mean, they're right. native yes, to. Yes, they do. But their value is in a different way. Again. Being a seasonal operation in, in Indiana, you know, after the season, well, you, you let everybody go and uh, you keep on a few people to sure. put labels on cans and so forth. Um, so they were, they were in that situation, high peak and then nobody and then high peak. So uh, they were able now to get paste from California, tomato paste, in our Sholey bags, 300 gallon bags, and then they could make product year round. So now they keep probably has, I don't know, 800, 1,000 people year-round uh, making product. They never, they never stop. They make the fresh pack when the season's here, and when it's not, then they make the other, hmm. the sauces. That worked and, out uh, extremely yes, well, yes. looking for the long haul. That's right. So yeah. that's, it's really made them uh, a right. year-round operation. Right, yeah. yeah. Now we bring us to the World Food Prize. Mm -hmm. And this is a 
was a wonderful, in my very best wishes. Mm -hmm. And tell well, us a uh, little bit how you came about and a little bit about the prize itself, too. Yes. Um, well, first of all, the prize itself was established by Norman Borlaug. Okay. Um, he, uh, he's known as the father of the Green Revolution and uh, has been accredited of saving maybe a billion lives as with this dwarf wheat uh, that was used first in Mexico and then India and, and Pakistan and others. Um, he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize for that. Right. And while he was there, he tried to convince the, the Nobel people to establish one for agriculture and food. And they, w they wouldn't do that because that wasn't in their, their uh, structure or whatever to, to do that. So he decided he would come back to the U.S. and make one himself. And so he got early sponsorship from General Foods and some others, started it in 86, I believe, and now has um, a large trucking family, uh, the Ruan family, to sponsor uh, this, uh, this award. And so it's been given once a year since 86. Uh, never to a food processing person. So I was- You're the first. I'm the first to, to receive it. It's mostly been for the production production agriculture. Um, some four years before this, I, my department and my professional group, uh, the Institute of Food Technologists, said that they wanted to submit my name. They thought if there was anyone that might have a chance, it would be, would be my, my work. And I said, you're crazy, but they did. And so I have to give them a lot of credit to start pulling things together, getting letters and, uh, and support. And of course, I really didn't realize the impact, to be honest, that it had had uh, around the world. It was even used in, the, in Katrina and the tsunamis and uh, all parts of uh, the developing parts of the world. So I totally had forgotten about it. And uh, I mean, Do they ever, excuse me, do they ever let you, if you're nominated, you never, do you hear that no, you didn't get it? No, never it's hear it. In, it's yeah, interesting. I don't hear anything. I yeah. share with you and some mm -hmm. of the others that I've interviewed, it, Sometimes you're nominated more than once, and mm -hmm. sometimes there's a, ga a gap in gap, the time. And yes. the process, I don't think, certainly a lot of the researchers, they think it's, you, got, you got it this year, so you were yeah. nominated this yeah. year. Yeah, no, that wasn't the case. And so I had totally, really, to be honest with you, I'd forgotten about it. And now I'm back at Purdue, I'm teaching, um, sort of between classes, and I get a phone call. And it's Ambassador Quinn uh, calling, and uh, want to know if I had heard of the World Food Prize, and of course, totally out of context. I said, sure, I'd heard about it. Had I ever been to the uh, ceremony? And no, I had not. And uh, he sort of just kept talking like that, and I thought he was trying to sell me tickets to the, to the banquet. <laughs> <laughs> so I almost hung up on him. He said, well, what, well, no, wait a minute. He says, I think you'll come this October. So uh, that's when I was told, and, and this was in May, and I was not to tell anybody until it was to be announced in the State Department uh, in June. So, and I, of course, I wanted to go on top of the building and shout, but uh, couldn't do that. Told my family, of course, but uh, I couldn't, what a couldn't tell line. any of my colleagues. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the ceremony, and, and, and you had a surprise with the Glee Club. Oh, thing. my goodness. The ceremony was magical. I mean, it was uh, fanfare trumpets. Uh, I think there were... Uh, 65 countries represented. It was in the state capital there in Iowa. Um, the reason of Iowa is that's where uh, Norman Borlaug's from and also the I was going to ask the, you that question why it was held there. It was the held Rwanda. there every year, is that yes, correct? Yes, in Des Moines. And of course, when I told my family, I said, we're not going to Norway or Sweden. I said, we're going to we're going to Des Moines. <laughs> We're going to Iowa. <laughs> well, it couldn't have been more perfect sure. uh, right. than being there. The capital is just incredible, gilted gold here everywhere, and uh, it was held in the in the rooms there, um, the uh, Senate rooms, I guess it was, chambers. Um, Do they yeah. give you any preliminaries up front? Do you know if you have to make any comment or what? They they uh, they ran me through. I didn't, there's a, they put together a film um, that they show, and I, I hadn't seen that, never saw that. Uh, but they about said, the prize and the About program. me, personally. Oh, okay. Personally, yeah. And um, it's about a 10, 15 minute uh, special. And so, uh, you know, I didn't, I still didn't see it until that, I un't even see it that night, but got to see it later. 
so they ran me through what I would do I, when they would I would come in after the after the prime minister of Niger and this and that and uh, so it was sort of a foggy m maze but <laughs> I knew I was supposed to walk up and then I had 30 seconds to say uh, say something so that was it that was it and the president was the president of Oh, yes, and then of course they 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 said at the end they didn't know what to how to close the the event because they didn't know what the music was from uh, what music type what came from Indiana, <laughs> and then they said, well, we'd like to introduce the Purdue Glee Club. And of course, I would, could have picked me up off of the floor. I bet they had uh, kept a total secret. They'd hidden the buses so I wouldn't see it see them at all. And uh, so yeah, it was a real Purdue night. And here we were uh, at the end singing Hail Purdue, clapping, and I'm looking and seeing all these foreign people and a lot of Iowa people uh, clapping and, and uh, to Hail Purdue. And of course what a we, great feeling. We played Iowa in football the next weekend. Fortunately, we won. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. And that you're, you're still pretty active with the Institute of uh, Food Technology. Food Technology, right, yes. I was, I was president of that, that right. group. It's about a 26,000 member group. Um, yeah, I w I'm still, still on committees. and Keep, and keep, keep pretty keep active. My, right. And I do still do quite a bit of consulting, too. Right. And a couple of the other awards that you've gotten mm -hmm. is the, uh, what about the, uh, which is nice, the one that Governor Daniels has established? Oh, my goodness. That was another big surprise. And that just happened uh, this past fall. Um, he announced the uh, the Philippine Nelson Innovation Award for for, uh, for scientist uh, innovation here in Indiana. So we'll be announcing the, the establishment. I mean, that's been established, but we'll be announcing the the, uh, the actual criteria uh, probably in the next month. Is uh, it going to be limited just to Indiana? I think it'll be limited. Uh, yeah, I think I'll it's think it's really. I did. Read I don't know if that's release. Good, that's firm, but I th I'm pretty sure it's to stimulate. Uh, young scientists who have made contributions. And in, it's to be in given Indiana. on an annual basis? Annual basis, yes, uh -huh. annual basis. That'll yeah. be very yeah. nice. Oh, it's exciting. You also got the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Award, mm -hmm. which is? That was a nice award, yeah, that was recognized for my work uh, I had done. And then the, the, the other, my professional group, the top award is the Nicholas Appare Award. Um, and, and I was able to Win that one some time back, so I was very. I thought that was the pinnacle. I thought that was the top award, but then we the, keep moving up. The, the others right. keep. There's coming, always that next along. level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think here at Purdue, I've worked under probably five presidents and seven deans. In my you tenure. came. Uh, came when in '61. Yeah, it was, it was Hovde was still, Hovde was still here. Hovde so was still yeah. here. Yeah. And each each brings yeah. something different, and you had totally different. Right. Totally different. Right. Um, yes. And then it was Dr. Beering who uh, asked me if I would uh, consider being a faculty rep to the Big Ten and NCAA. I was going to ask you about yeah. that. What, what, uh, what I had been on the committee. In fact, actually, I was on the committee uh, when Bobby Knight was acting up, and uh, we met with uh, President Ryan, and the committee did. And, uh, was that at the others. chair The chair, the in chair incidents and the donkey he brought on his show saying that this would make a good president, new president of Purdue. This was, so I had been on that committee. And then um, when Dr. Bering came, I get a phone call. And I hadn't met him at all and didn't know him. And uh, that's when he asked me if I would consider doing this. And I was just starting the department. And I said, oh, I don't know. I said, if you, I'm really committed to the department. But if you don't want a full-time faculty rep, why? And which he didn't, of course. And he said, no, well, let's try it. So. Twenty years later, were you with? Uh, were you on the athletic committee for the Senate, or this was this was the Big Ten? No, this exactly. is Big Ten NCAA. Exactly. It's a right. it's a special position. It's selected by the president, and it, it's it's the role between uh, liaison between the Senate and the president. Okay. Uh, now there is a committee. People are on a committee for three years, and those those rotate. But but this this was a, a permanent position. What sort of things were you? Did you uh, does the committee handle? Yeah, this issues? well, this we would actually. Um, uh, our role was then to represent Purdue at the Big Ten meetings and then NCAA meetings. We would go and vote on uh, on various issues, uh, always looking at at the student athlete. That was that was sure. the role, and and my role was to as faculty rep was to 
you know, understand the athletic department, but not be too close to the athletic department, and then, of course, understand where the university and the president were, were anxious and athletics going mm -hmm. in. They really focus on the student athlete. Right. Does the presidents of, of the Big Ten are also on the uh, are yes, they, yes, as well? Yes, we would meet with the presidents uh, of, at, of all the Big Ten schools. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we would meet with the coaches and the athletic directors at other times of all the Big Ten schools. That, so. You have to cover the bowls, too, at the same time, well, right? Well, fortunately, uh, yeah, or unfortunately, <laughs> back when I, early on, Purdue wasn't going to any That's bowls. Right. And I had to represent the Big Ten at the Rose Bowl, so I had to go dress rooting for Michigan and Iowa and <laughs> Michigan State. But it was uh, it was it was good good time. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was very impressed. With, yeah, with the, uh, it was a good good experience. Good experience. Right. Tell us a little bit about that partnership with the university in Bangkok, how that came about, and does it it's still going on? Still going on. Uh -huh. uh, yes, we um, we certainly as a department. Um, uh, we establish what makes the department great, and our, we we uh, we early on uh, had a had a vision, and our vision was to be the leading food science department worldwide. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking, arguing over the and a, being a leading or being the leading, and we decided that we wanted to be the leading. And then when you say that, then you begin to list what makes one a leading university, and of course. Uh, you could name facilities, faculty, students, uh, research monies, you go down the list. And one was having an international uh, presence. And so uh, I was able on a trip to uh, visit uh, Kassasart University and uh, we established then a, a relationship and so we have many of their students coming here and we have a lot of our faculty going there. Mm -hmm. uh, there it's in Bangkok. What, what type of school is it? Uh, is it it's, an it's, it's an ag school, but okay. they have a large food science department. I suppose they have 300 undergrad students just oh. in food science there. We also had a similar uh, relationship with uh, uh, the ETH University in Zurich, Switzerland, and we exchanged students there. Uh, a little difficult for our students, and uh, I think we only end up having one that went there. They had to be able to speak German. Oh. Uh, and understand German, and so that was was difficult. But we did have a student that uh, uh, from Indiana that was able to go there and, uh, yeah. and study for a year. What about the how's the placement for your the students? Oh, that's that's the good news. Uh, 100 percent placement since the department was formed. We have 100 percent placement. And, do uh, where do, do most of them go to industry? 90 percent of the undergraduates go directly into industry, and 10 percent go on for advanced degrees. Of that 90% that go into industry, 40% end up getting a master's, either in business or in come back and get one in food science. And many times, for most of them, the companies send them. So um, they're in Chicago, so they actually end up getting degrees uh, mm -hmm. close by. Yeah. So the placement is quite good then. Yeah. It's good. And, and, and it's is the graduate enrollment in the school, has that increased over time? Oh, certainly. Yeah, we're now, um, we're probably 80, and, uh, 80 graduate students. And uh, we're about two-thirds, one-third, a, th a third are international. And it's not uncommon at any one time to have 20-some countries represented in our little, little department here on campus. So um, food is obviously very important around the world. Oh, yes. We have programs in, in Africa. Um, uh, Dr. Hammaker is, is, has quite a, a program there. Uh, we have relationships. In fact, I just had lunch uh, this week with five students from Honduras, uh, Zamorano University there. Uh, yeah, we're... Uh, Not we're got we good are, relationships and quite, quite a few. We do. We right. have quite a few, right. yes. Yeah, fortunately. And you got the your the endowed chair in food processing. That's very you know that was that was really uh, uh, unexpected. The uh, Mr. Shirley, the father, had passed away, and uh, it was the family who decided to uh, recognize Purdue and uh, obviously my relationship with him by giving uh, mm -hmm. support here for the endowed chair. Yes. Yeah. Is that a pretty uh, good sized company? Uh, large it is. They're, they're now... Yeah, you worked with them. Yes, yeah. Right. They've grown into a, a very large company. Still, still family owned, uh, but they're probably in 180 countries around the world now uh, with their bag and box technology. So uh, it's, yeah, it's amazing to see these companies and the the one the beer industry company has just flourished they're making these tanks all over the world 
we're putting in a big installation in Spain and Citrus and Morocco and it's just it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome it, when you, it is, when you, it really when you is. look at it from the outside from, from yeah. the little 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 tank that started it all <laughs> right um, tell us a little about your family and uh, um, they, they live in uh -huh. Indiana or uh, family they, they have uh, have a daughter and two sons a uh, daughter lives in Ann Arbor as three daughters so we have three granddaughters there our um, son uh, the two sons went to uh, uh, Purdue uh, got their degrees here. One is uh, ended up getting his um, MD. He's a physician in Milwaukee and has a little daughter, uh, granddaughter. And then our younger son got an M ME degree here and uh, is in California. Just had their three weeks ago had their daughter. So we have five granddaughters. And, lots uh, to visit. It makes it nice. It, yeah. it does. Yes. Lots. Yeah. Lots of good right. places. Yeah. The strategic plan. Did, uh, mm -hmm. Any comment on that? You were sort of here. You mean for yeah. the current coming yeah, up? Yeah, right. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not. I'm not directly involved in that because I think uh, we need the the, the people who are going to make it happen. One. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, certainly yeah. involved in the other one. Right. This one, um, you know, it's, it'll be important. And oh, yeah. uh, President uh, uh, Cordova, I, I'm certainly will lead us into a. All the presents are different. And That's it, right. It, it's fortunate. It seems like they're there at the right time. Um, just happen uh, to step in. Just happen right. to come along. Just happen. Right the time. opening kind yeah, of, you know, yeah. the window was there. I remember yeah. Hanson was really a student president, and that was important at the time when he was here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Dr. Hovde was he'd been here quite a while Long when time. you came. Yes. You know? oh, and yes. that's one of the longest ones that we've. Most of them don't seem to stay quite. That's right. Uh, the, the average seems over time. It's, when we and look it's at changed, it. yes. Yeah, it has and changed. There was, there was some studies done uh, a few years ago as to what makes a university great. And often the number one thing was the tenure of the, of the administration. That um, a, a president that had been there for a long time seemed to strengthen that university. So, uh, but, seem, but today it seems like we, we have a quicker turnover. Things do change. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, you got a favorite memory of Purdue, and how about an outstanding event? You think of oh, that. my goodness. Um, a favorite memory. Or well, of course, you know, as a student, when we beat Michigan State, and we marched down the, down the State Street Hill, and Hovde's house was over in Lafayette, and we went over to try to convince him that we wouldn't have class on Monday. I mean, there were thousands of us. And uh, he w said- Were they undefeated at that time? Yes, they, oh. were, they, were, they were number one, yeah. And we upset and we were, of course, have always been known as the spoiler makers. <laughs> and uh, Hovde said, no, we wouldn't honor Michigan State that way. We, we would have classes on Monday. <laughs> I don't think many of us went, but <laughs> I mean, that was- It was a good there, there are many memories of oh, Purdue, sure. but uh, that's uh, the one that just comes to mind right. out of the blue. Yeah. yeah. Do you have an outstanding event that happens to come to your mind? Outstanding event was- uh, We have heavy. so many that's- Well, there were, and of course, I can, most recent outstanding event was waving the flag and leading the cheer shout at the football game <laughs> so after Neil Armstrong and Drew Brees and then me. So that was- I was there, I saw you. <laughs> that was, we didn't win, unfortunately, but I don't hope I- That's kind of cool. That. That, that was cool, that, yeah. that is cool. Any yeah. uh, closing remarks or comments that you'd like to share? For well, obviously, I am bleed black and gold. Had several times and opportunities to uh, leave Purdue and move on in various capacities, both in industry and academia, and uh, decided that at the time it was important. I was starting a research program, and I didn't want to uh, not finish that here, and then start a department. And on and on, athletics, you know, I was, was involved in getting Tiller here, and well, more, maybe more important, Morgan Burke. and. Uh, um, so they're all uh, all sort of wrapped together and uh, all had a great. There was impact. always something coming. That something coming up, and, right? Um, so and you knew you could make it uh, and, and, and handle it. Yes, so. and so it was always a challenge. But yeah. uh, now you've gone to, you're going to half time now. Is that half practice? time? And we'll soon be retiring. We've moved to northern Michigan. Believe it or not, didn't want to move south with all the old people. So <laughs> we're just south of the Mackinac, we're about to, uh, just south of the Mackinac Bridge, just north Ooh. of Petoskey. Okay. And uh, we, uh, we've always had a little place there on the lake, and uh, we decided that's where our children and grandchildren want to come, both summer and winter, because they're skiing there. 
So uh, sounds very for, nice. For the, for the time being, that's that that will be our home. Yeah. Okay. Sounds but we'll be back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, well, Ms. Thank Ms. you. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Nelson. Great. <clears throat>